Hello, this is Dan Alford with Arc Specialties. Today I'm talking about my favorite welding process, submerged arc welding and robots. Because when you combine the two, you can do great things. It's a very old process. A lot of people consider it not to be viable anymore. Personally, I think it's the best welding process. I found it odd. Some people don't actually have a favorite welding process, but by the end of today's talk, I suspect you too will agree submerged arc welding is pretty remarkable. It's a 90-year-old process, so what we're going to go over today is the history. I'm going to describe the process, talk about the technology, the advantages and disadvantages, talk about robots and subarcs, when and why you would apply the two together, and then give you a few case studies to prove my point. So the history of subarc, it was invented in 1933 by three fellows. They uh, sold the rights to Union Carbide, which was Lindy, uh, and nowadays that's called uh, LTEC or ESOB. And then it was marketed as union melt. At first they paid a five cents per pound fee. That's a lot of money back in the day. And uh, that's kind of interesting because the welding industry has gone full, full circle and we're seeing some of the manufacturers charged by the pound again. So Lincoln copies it, calls it hidden arc. They get sued. It goes all the way to Supreme Court. Lindy wins. Lindy raises the prices and drops the fee. And the rest is history. So I took this definition directly out of the welding handbook dated 1969. Submerged arc welding is defined by the American Welding Society as an arc welding process wherein coalescence is produced by heating with an arc or arcs between a bare metal electrode or electrodes and the work. The arc is shielded by a blanket of granular fusible material on the work. Pressure is not used and filler materials obtained from the electrode and sometimes from a supplementary welding rod. That's the definition, but if you look at 1995, hardly anything has changed. Like I said, it's an old process and not many aspects of the technology have been updated. There's a few exceptions though. So let's go down to the basic principles of it. So what you see in the diagram here, the, uh, the golden tube is providing the flux. It can be pumped in, it could be gravity fed. And so the direction of travel is to the right. And so the flux leads the wire, then the silver wire feeds into the puddle. That that wire is energized from power supply, could be AC or DC. And then beneath that puddle or that, that flux covering, we have a well puddle beneath that. And above that, we have molten flux. And so the arc is completely shielded. It's contained underneath the flux in the slag. You don't see any arc, you don't see any smoke. And the beauty of this is the flux actually acts as a deoxidizer. So you get some extremely high quality welds with very little oxide. So that's the basic principle. But this is why I like the process. This is the deposition rate chart. And on the left side, you can see it goes from zero to 1.6. And these are pounds per minute. So you can imagine at one pound per minute, that's 60 pounds per hour. And here's my point. If you plot where gas tungsten arc or TIG is, we're way down here below 0.1 pounds per minute. MIG is a little bit faster and flux score is faster yet, maybe 20 pounds an hour, but nothing approaches the productivity of submerged arc welding because in the field of welding, productivity is deposition rate. That's pounds per hour deposited. You can't beat sub arc. So that we'll get into the advantages. There's no visible arc. We have the highest deposition rates up to 100 pounds. I've only gone to 60 personally. High speeds up to 100 inches per minute. It's very easy to operate. It's pre-qualified by the American Welding Society in their D1.1 structural welding code. And this is noteworthy because that indicates to me that it's a process that's so reliable, you don't have to qualify it. It's pre-qualified. We have a very low defect rate, low fume generation, deep penetration, you go up to 70% base metal if you're using a electrode positive. And if you want low penetration, we can go electrode negative and you have down to 10%. So you can go either way with this. What are the disadvantages? It's only used on ferrous steel and nickel alloys. So it's limited in what you can do with it. Uh, it's only used in the flat and horizontal. Of course, there's a few exceptions, like some of the uh, big storage tanks, but, but generally flat and horizontal. And you must remove the slag between passes. And then flux is required. And usually you have to use one and a half pounds of flux per pound of wire. And normally this requires automation. There's a few exceptions. They had some squirt guns back in the day where you could sub by hand, but really it's, it's an automation process. 
And flux handling can be cumbersome, particularly if you have a hydrogen sensitive material where you have to make sure the, uh, the flux remains dry and baked out and it has high heat input, which means you need a relatively large workpiece for this to, to work for you. So we're going to talk about the variations on submerged arc welding. There can be multi-wire, narrow gap, AC, straight polarity, constant current, you can add additional filler material, and we'll talk about electro slag. So here's the multiple wire. Most uh, long seam welds on line pipe are welded with multiple wire submerged arc. So what you can see there is leading it is a uh, flux tube, dropping the flux in. In this case, we're going from right to left, and then we see two wires, and then we have behind it a uh, flux vacuum. We're, we're sucking up most of the flux and recycling it. And this way we can double our deposition rate by running multiple wires. I've seen them as many as five wires on some of the, uh, the pipe welding machines. And you'd think this would increase heat input, but you can pretty much treat each wire as though it was a separate welding power supply and separate weld. So next variation is narrow gap. To speed up welding, one way to do it is you uh, reduce the groove from a 75 degree included angle all the way down to 14. This means you have much less weld volume, which means less weld time, less wire usage, and less distortion. But unfortunately, this requires more complicated equipment and uh, the fit up is more challenging. So here's something we came up with a while back. This is uh, uh, something we uh, actually patented. This one, we're actually moving the wire left and right. You can see there in the video that the wire is pointing to the left. And so just like a human would do, we're welding the left side of the joint first, and then we t uh, cast the wire to the other side. And over on the right, you can see a guided bin test of a finished weld. We're able to weld a square groove a couple inches thick with submerged arc, something you can't normally do. This is something we invented just before Fukushima. And we were convinced that this was going to be useful in uh, nuclear power. And then we had Fukushima, so nuclear power kind of went away. But now there's, being, there's a renaissance in nuclear power, so we're hopeful that we'll get to uh, run this again. So here you actually see it welding. We're moving along, see no arc, no sparks, no smoke. And uh, we're making a weld down at near the bottom of the joint. Next variation is electro slag welding. This, this is an interesting variation. The only difference between electro slag and submerged arc welding are welding parameters and flux composition. With submerged arc welding, you actually have an arc in gas, much like uh, any other arc welding processes. But in electro slag, the arc is through a liquid. And so some of the, slag, some, some of the flux melts and the arc is actually through the liquid. In this case, we're using a strip and strip welding is unusual because we can create a very wide bead, let's say 60 millimeters across in a single bead. If you look over on the right, this is a, a couple of additive processes. The, down on the bottom, we're making a, uh, a vessel, which is two inches thick. And by using a strip rather than a wire, we're able to make the entire vessel in a single pass. And up above it, this is another additive job. What we've done is we've built the walls with a gas tungsten arc welding process. And then we're welding the entire area between the two walls with electro slag. Amazing process, underutilized in industry. Talk about another variation. This is AC. And the reason we use AC in submerged arc welding is it's immune to arc blow, which is magnetic arc uh, deflection. So when we build systems that weld the IDs of pipes, for example, and you have a lot of arc blow problems, AC is one way to get around this. Uh, there's less penetration because you have electrode positive, we have 70% of the heat in the part, more penetration. If you have electrode negative, only 30% is heat in the part, less penetration, better for cladding. But with AC, it's 50-50. And so with you have a, when you have an AC variable waveform power supply, which is some of the latest in the industry, you can actually change it anywhere from 30 to 70% electrode positive, but there is no free lunch. As you decrease penetration, you also decrease fusion and you will end up with more defects. Once again, just another variable, sometimes it's useful. So uh, over on the left, that was AC back in the day. And then the, the next generation, we had square wave. Uh, the square wave AC was an improvement because you could control uh, 
the arc better. And then the, finally we came up with an AC variable waveform. So we're able to change the percentage of electrode positive and electrode negative. So here's a cross section diagram of the three. Over on the left, we have electrode positive. That's a deep penetrating weld. In the center, we have AC. And over on the right, we have electrode negative, low penetration. So if you want high fusion, you use the electrode positive. If you wanted a clad, you use electrode negative, AC, kind of in the middle. There's a couple other variations on the process. You can either use constant voltage, which is frequently used. But when you get into high currents, you have better arc stability with constant current. And so with constant current, we set a constant welding current, and then the power supply doesn't chase the, uh, the ripples in the puddle as much. So what we tend to do is when you're running at the high amps, we'll, we'll go with constant current. There's some other variations. We can add a different, different uh, filler materials in addition to the uh, wire itself. You can add bulk powder. We've uh, been known to put metal powders ahead of the flux and then flux on top of that and then weld over that. And you can do that to either increase deposition rate without adding heat or changing chemistry. We can also add cold wire where we uh, send a second wire that's not energized in the puddle. Again, you can add filler without heat. And the third variation is hot wire where you can add filler with additional heat built into the wire using a hot wire power supply. Just more variations on the process. So what's the point of the flux? So, Here's some uh, submerged arc welding flux. It's a granular, looks much like sand. The first reason for it is to shield from air because when you have heated metal, it reacts very quickly with oxygen and nitrogen. Second function of this is a deoxidizer. And this is one of the reasons I like the process is because unlike gas shielded processes, you actually have a deoxidizer in the flux. So if you have any oxides present, the deoxidizers will scavenge them. Uh, it provides some resistance heating, but most of the, uh, the heat is provided by the arc. And it, they've been known back in the day to add alloying elements. So rather than having to have a, a specific wire for every application, you could add alloying elements in, in the flux. And it protects the wells after solidification. So when you finally peel the flux from the wells, uh, the surface is almost always oxide free. So what's not to love? It only works in the flat position because of gravity. So the problem with flux is you can't work upside down. You can't put flux overhead. So this is where robots come in. So robots will allow you to do parts which you couldn't do otherwise. So this is a BX groove. It's a, an oval, they call it a racetrack weld. And that's an actual sub arc going on right now. You can see just a little bit of arc, little few sparks. And over on the right, you see the finished weld. What we're doing is we're inlaying this BX groove with ink canal with submerged arc. And you can see on the guided bend specimen, it's past the bend and, uh, and it's fully fused. And that's an ink canal inlay. Why you, what you're seeing here on the left side is the flux is peeling away. And that's something we try to do. If you set your parameters correctly, the flux will actually peel away on its own. And this greatly reduces the problems of uh, slag removal. So that was, that's a good robot application. Since it's not round, you couldn't do it with just a turntable, but it's a great job for a robot. Here's another one where uh, robotic submerged arc welding of flanges. And uh, once again, this is a, a good robot job. The, the motion is too complex for a standard manipulator positioner type application, but it works well with the robot. This one I'm, I'm particularly proud of. This is a submerged arc welding of large fabrication. So imagine trying to weld a, a, a three foot pipe to a rectangular tube. And that's what you're seeing right now. This is sped up, of course, but the robot is an arc six robot and we're coordinating the motion of the robot with the part positioner. And so what's happening here is we're always keeping that torch in the flat position, actually slightly uphill. Uh, that's because that's the best way to weld with submerged arc. But you can see on a close up here, the, as the uh, robot rotates the part and manipulates the torch simultaneously, we're able to weld continuously around this part. I would say without a robot, the best way to weld this part would be actually eight welds. You'd make four sub arc welds along the major lines of the intersection, and then you would have a human weld around the corners. And this is the way most people do it in industry. The problem with that is every stop and start is a potential defect. 
And by using coordinated motion with our large arc six robot, we're able to make this well continuously, no stops, only, only one start, one stop, all the way through the part. It's a great application. It requires very large machines. There aren't any commercially available robots that can handle this, and that's why we build our own right here in Houston, Texas. So this one is additive manufacturing with subart. So what we've done is we uh, went offline. I think we're using Robot Master, and we have designed this flange. You see it over on the right. Uh, and then we've sliced it, and then we've turned that part program into a robot program, and then we welded it with submerged arc welding. We could have done this with uh, gas metal arc welding or some other additive process, but in this case, we're welding at several times the rate you would do with a gas metal arc welder. And better yet, we have no oxide problems. One of the big problems I have with additive manufacturing is oxide buildup. Each layer has a certain amount of oxides, and the problem with oxides is they melt at a point much higher than the melting point of the steel itself. And so you can see we actually ran some mechanical tests. Uh, Sharpies, impacts, tensiles, and yield uh, were all acceptable on this part. Over on the right side, you see the finished part. We only machined half the flange just to demonstrate what we've done. But uh, it's, a, it's a great process for additive because we have very sound welds no oxide problems, and extremely high productivity due to the high deposition rates. This is something we've had a lot of success on. Uh, we're welding up the blowout preventer uh, ram bore cavity. The problem with the ram bore cavity, this is just a mock-up here. This oval it is, uh, simulates the ram bore. This is our submerged arc torch. You can see the wire going around the corner. These are actually rollers because with submerged arc, you're using large wires. So if we zoom in close on this torch, you can see the torch is slightly uphill. That's, that's the goal in submerged arc welding. You want to weld slightly uphill. That reduces defects. And so we went along the flat area, and now we're ro rotating around the, uh, the round area. But you can see what the robot's having to do in order to generate that motion. We're having to coordinate the motion of the part and the robot simultaneously. And by doing that, we're able to weld these blow-up preventer cavities continuously without interrupting the weld, without stops and starts. We've got these running all over the world. It's a great application. It's, it's interesting to me, uh, the old way of doing this required welding perpendicular to the straight lines, uh, which had two problems. A, it was slow, and uh, B, you had too many stops and starts. Our technique, much faster. In fact, it's seven times faster. Uh, and we're able to weld continuously. This has been a big success for us. So good application for submerged arc on large parts as long as you can manipulate the part and always keep your weld joint flat. Thanks for attending today. Hopefully now uh, subarc is your favorite process, just like me. And if you think you have an application for submerged arc welding on heavy parts, give us a call. Arc Specialties thrives on problems. Send us yours.